Welcome everyone. Today's webinar will give an introduction to cellular IoT. My name is Petter Myhre and I work as a product marketing manager for Nordic. In my job as a product marketing manager, I promote Nordic's products and technologies, both on the cellular IoT side, which I will talk about today, but also on the short range wireless side with Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth Mesh, Thread and Zigbee. Then over to some practicalities for this webinar. It will last approximately 50 to 60 minutes, maybe a few minutes more. Questions are encouraged. Please type questions in the, type of, uh, in the top of the right sidebar. All questions are anonymous and uh, I encourage you all to try to keep them relevant to the topic. I will answer questions towards the end as many as I have time for. And I also want to say that the chat at the bottom right is not anonymous and please do not use this for questions. If you have more questions or your question, question didn't get a proper answer, please use DevZone where, where our application engineers are ready to, to help out. A recording of this webinar will be available together with the presentation at webinars.nordxme.com. Hopefully tomorrow. So this is the content for today. First, I will go a bit into what cellular IoT actually is. Then I give a short introduction to LTE, what that is and how cellular IoT fits into that. Talk a bit about the, the LP van landscape and talk about the benefits of cellular IoT. Then I talk about how you can get your device connected to the network, how you can transfer data and the different connection modes that you have there. I have a few slides on SIM cards, what the different types are and what you should look for when uh, selecting a SIM card for your cellular IoT device. Power consumption is essential for cellular IoT, so I'll talk a bit about that. And then in the end, I will talk about how distance affects the protocol behavior. So what is cellular IoT? So cellular IoT for Nordic is about connecting anything and everything without the need of a smartphone or a gateway. We want the devices to be connected to straight to the base station and always be able to have uh, this connection even though if you are at home or if you're outside or somewhere in between. The cellular technologies LTM and MBIT mixed with Nordic's low power experience enable cellular IoT. Now you can make small low, low power cellular products that just wasn't feasible before. So the new low power LTE technologies, LTM and MBIT. This is mostly what I'm going to talk about today, these technologies. Um, just for reference, uh, these are also known as EMTC. And uh, they're also referred to as LTCAT M1 or just M1 and LTCAT MB1. And I'll explain that a bit uh, later in the slides. The difference, uh, here are a few key parameters about the differences between them. The first one is bandwidth. So the, the LTM bandwidth is 1.4 megahertz, while the MBIoT has 200 kilohertz. The smaller bandwidth of MBIoT typically gives longer range, but uh, less throughput. And uh, LTM get a, gets a little less range, but higher throughput. And that you can see in the in the max throughput uh, row just below, where you have DL and UL, uh, which is downlink and uplink. Downlink is from the base station down to the device, and uplink is from the device up to the base station. Also put in some range numbers there. So these are typical range. Uh, the, the maximum numbers are much higher, and I've seen 
test done where you get up to 100 kilometers. But in typical operation, these are the kind of maximum ranges that we, we see our devices operate in. And that is mostly because you have uh, base stations, uh, which a device can connect to uh, before it's moving too far away. And this is also where you get an efficient uh, transfer of data. Mobility here means cell reselection and handover so that uh, the devices can uh, automatically detect if they're getting too far from a base station and uh, connect to another one in a seamless way. And uh, handover is also supported uh, just like with your smartphone where you also use LTE so that when you're driving on a highway and you're talking to your best friend, the connection isn't broken. And this is also supported on these technologies. You can also roam. So you can uh, move from one operator to another with uh, LTM. And this is because they are using the same agreements that they have for roaming on the uh, typical uh, LTE products. But these are not yet in place for MBIoT. MBIoT is also typically dependable on each operator's core network to relay data to and from the device. I'll explain that in detail later. But with both of these technologies, it's possible to achieve up to 15 years battery lifetime. But that, of course, depends on your application and what you're doing with the, pro with the technologies. Then I've listed some strengths with LTM and MBIoT. So with LTM, you get high throughput compared to MBIoT, you get lower latency. You are able to roam with LTM. And uh, it's most power efficient at medium data rates. So kind of the more data you're sending, the more efficient is it. And it's also suitable for TCP, TLS, end-to-end -end secure connections so that you can have a IP connection from your device to, to the cloud directly. And this is uh, because you have some overhead when using these protocols, which is not really suited for MBIoT because of the limited throughput that you have. When it comes to MBIoT, you get longer range you get better penetration and it's efficient if you have very low data rates. And also an important thing is that the, the throughput for LTM also enables efficient over the air updates if you want to update the firmware on your device. So here I have some typical LTM applications and some typical requirements for uh, for LTM or for products uh, selecting LTM is that they are global and they require roaming. They don't need to be global, but they want to operate in more than one region with more than one operator. Typically has uh, higher data transfer requirements or latency requirements. So the big one is uh, asset tracking to the left here. Where you have uh, shipping containers, trailers, pallets, packets, luggage, and livestock, and the list goes on and on. And when you want to track your assets, you want to know their location. And you can do this using GPS, for example, or get a rough location from the base station. Also, you could have several sub items inside the thing you're tracking, for example, in a shipping container. And then you maybe want to track the or monitor the condition of these devices. And then you can use a, another wireless technology for that. For example, Bluetooth Low Energy and combine this. Then you have variables, uh, smartwatches, GPS watches, uh, or medical devices as well. And here you are removing the need to have a smartphone with you to be connected. And a good example of this, this is uh, the GPS watch, of course. When you are out running, you don't want to bring your smartphone with you. 
and you can still be reached with simple messages. You also have the remote uh, healthcare and medical monitoring. Here a big benefit is the easy setup. Uh, when the patient leaves the hospital, it's already connected. The device uh, that they bring with them is already connected. They don't have to um, connect it to their Wi-Fi and it works outside uh, the house as well. Then you have retail and uh, post point of sale. And this could be payment terminals in small shops and, and, uh, and markets and also vending machines where you want to have a battery operated secure connection. Also interesting use case is product as a service where the supplier, um, where the customer can rent uh, a, a product and uh, the, the supplier manages everything with the subscription, maintenance and so on. Home security. This is an, uh, also an interesting application for LTM, where you have door locks, alarms, smoke detectors, flood detection that you might not want to uh, run off the main power in case of a power outage. And you get the, the LTE, LTE security, of course, or IP security as well in these devices so that they are, uh, are secure. So typical MB IoT applications are stationary. They're regional to uh, belonging to uh, where the products are going to operate in a, in a region where it's only one carrier or with one, uh, one operator, I mean. And uh, they sometimes require longer range. So the first one is smart metering with both uh, with the, all of the, the three main ones, electricity, gas, and water. And um, these are typically rolled out in a region, specific region, and they could be in places where you need this uh, extra range. Smart agriculture, where you want to monitor the soil, uh, for example, moisture, fertilization, and the amount of sunlight the crops or plants are getting. These could be in uh, remote areas where there are not that many base stations. And then that uh, longer range is, uh, is beneficial. You have smart city, where you have smart parking, smart lighting, waste management applications, and predictive main maintenance with elevators, escalators, slush machines, and, uh, and so on. I also added this uh, LTM and MBIoT coverage map. This is taken from gsma.com. So you can have a look at it as well if this uh, has uh, updated. So yellow here is uh, that LTM is uh, rolled out nationally by one of the operators in the country. While blue is uh, MBIoT only and purple is LTM and MBIoT. So you can see that uh, there are more and more countries that are purple, which is great. So what is LTE? LTE is a cellular standard. And it stands for long-term evolution. And it's also referred to as, as 4G. And uh, the difference between this and uh, the previous cellular technologies is that it tries to maximize the bandwidth utilization. It tries to be as efficient as possible when transferring data and uh, managing how many devices that can operate in a, in a certain uh, spectrum. It supports up to 300 megabit per second, but uh, the technologies I'm going to talk to today uh, has much less bandwidth. And it's purely packet based. And this is a contrast to using circuit switching that was used in the older, older cellular technologies. LTE is managed by 3GPP. This is the third generation partnership project. And uh, they develop and maintain the cellular standards, including LTE. 
and the standards are structured as releases. So release 13, 14, 15, and so on. Currently, there are network support for release 13, most, uh, most places, and release 14 is uh, rolling out. And you also have release 15, which is kind of the first release that uh, is 5, uh, 5G, and this is an early adoption. And it's important to note that LTM and MBIT is also part of 5G. So the LTE products are split into categories. So you have 20, more than 20 categories. And, and the main difference between them is, uh, is uh, how, much, how much bandwidth the different categories have. So at the bottom here, you can see CATM1 and CATMB1, which are the two ones I'm going to talk about today. And they are also referred to as CAT M2 and CAT MB2 in release 14, adding more, more features. So let's also go through some terminology used in LTE. So you have uh, star networks. So you have the, the base stations in LTE, which are, which are called ENB or Evolved Node B. And this is the terminology I've tried to use in this presentation. But I may slip and say base station, but then you know what I mean. Then you have UE, user equipment, and the, those are the, referred to as the devices in the LTE network. I might slip on here as well and just use device, but when, uh, then I mean UE. Then you have UL and DL. UL is uplink and DL is downlink. Um, UL is from the UE up to the EMB and the downlink is from the EMB down to the UE. Over to bandwidth, there you also have some different uh, terms as well. You have FDD, frequency division duplex, meaning that uh, a UE uses a different frequency for UL and DL. And then you have TDD, time division duplex, which means that the device uses the same frequency in uh, UL and DL, but in different time slots. MIMO uh, stands for multiple input, multiple output. And here you use multiple TX and RX antennas to increase the bandwidth. HD, FD, half duplex, full duplex. Half duplex means that uh, the device can transmit uh, or receive, while full duplex means that it can transmit and receive at the same time. Mobile network operator. This is uh, the same as a carrier. And uh, in this presentation, I will short this with uh, MNO. I may also say operator. So the LTE bands, so there are 56 LTE bands from 400 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz. Some use FDD, some use TDD. And the different bands are licensed by different MNOs around the world. So how, does, how do the different products manage? So all LTE products run a subset of bands. Smartphones support many bands, but not all. And uh, iPhone is one of the best ones, uh, supports 28 bands and maybe more now. Traditional LT modules support maybe one to five bands, meaning they are uh, geographic or region specific, or they are uh, operator specific, only operating in a specific uh, region or with a specific uh, operator in, in a larger region. So when it comes to cellular IT in the LTE bands, the lower frequency bands provides longer range. 
So bands 12 and 13 are most common in the US, around 700 megahertz. And four is also used uh, as a mid-range band. And then you have in, in Europe and in Asia, you uh, typically uh, the, the bands 8, 20 and 28 are most common in the lower frequency, uh, while also 3 is, uh, is uh, popular in the mid-range. Also for cellular IoT, uh, the half duplex operation where you don't have to receive and transmit at the same time opens for much simpler multiband support and it enables the UE to operate in, in larger regions or even globally. And our device, the NRF9160, is currently certified for 17 bands and, uh, and more are coming. This means that we have global coverage with this device. Then over to bandwidth and LTE. So you have dynamic modulation and you have these different uh, modulation uh, schemes. BPSK, QPSK, 16QAM and 64QAM. And uh, where, the, where the higher level modulations is able to represent more bits per symbol than the lower ones. Resulting in, in higher throughput. But you cannot use these, uh, these uh, higher modulation modes uh, when you are uh, too far from the, the ENB. What is happening in LTE is that the, the modulation is changed depending on the signal quality. So you might start off in, uh, in 64 QAM and then we're moving away from the base station. You get 16 QAM, QPSK and so on. And this modulation can be different for uplink and uh, downlink. And it's dictated by the, the ENB. It is also using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing to transfer the, the symbols. And here we have up to 1200 subcarriers, 15 kilohertz apart. Then you have uh, MIMO with multiple TX and RX antennas. And you can use uh, full duplex in FTD, meaning that you send and receive on different uh, frequencies at the same time. But with cellular IoT, with LTM and MBIoT, you have uh, less bandwidth on these technologies compared to the more powerful uh, LTE technologies. In LTM, there is no 64 QAM, and MBIoT, there is no 64 QAM or 16. There is no support for uh, MIMO. You have 72 subcarriers maximum in LTM and 12 in MBIoT. And this is mainly because of the, the because they have less bandwidth, meaning that they uh, that the throughput is uh, is less compared to the higher level categories of LTE. LTM can use half duplex, while MBOT must use half the duplex. When it comes to the different modulation schemes. LTM uses both uh, QPSK and 16QM in both uplink and downlink depending on the signal quality. 16QM if it's close to the base station or the EMB and uh, when it's moving away it switches down to QPSK. For MBOT in uplink you can use, use BPSK and QPSK depending on the signal quality while well, it only uses QPSK in, in downlink. You have some different certifications as well. So some operators or MNOs have their own certifications like Verizon and Vodafone. But many, many operators only require the, the GCF and PTCRB certifications that kind of uh, tells you that uh, the, the device operates as it should according to the standard. 
and then you have regulatory certifications where you have uh, if where you have uh, this for all wireless devices in the different regions around the world and as i said the uh, nerf 9160 is supported for more in more than uh, 17 bands and it have has some different uh, certifications for the in all of these categories and you can see all this in in the link uh, on the slide here then over to the low power wide area network landscape so this is how we see it we have the the older technology there, 2G and 3G, which have more than enough throughput, but they are no low power, not low power. We also have the higher level categories of LTE, which also have high, high throughput, but they are not low power either. And then you have the, the sub 1 gigahertz ISM band LP bands, the SIGFOX and the LORAS, where you have uh, low power operation, but they're not very efficient and they have low throughput. And then you have cellular IT, which is somewhere in between, which we see as the, the sweet, sweet spot between low power and the throughput that you can get through your link. So then some cellular IoT advantages. So it's an open standard which large with large uh, industry support supported by the 3GP and other uh, powerful organizations. It's future proof. These technologies are not going away. They will be here for decades to come. And the standard is continuously evolving, adding more features and more capabilities, but it also offers backwards uh, compatibility. And then it's a very important point that if you make a cellular IoT product now, you can leverage the existing infrastructure. You don't need to think about that. And you can scale very, very quickly because the infrastructure is already there. You have global operation with uh, roaming possibilities. So you can make one product that works all, all over the world or you can make one uh, SKU that work in the different regions where you're going to sell your product. Security is of course important. And with cellular IoT, security is built into LTE, so you can leverage that. And this is a well-proven authentication scheme with the SIM cards and powerful encryption. And you can also use TLS or DTLS to have IP security in addition, so that you can secure the, your data from your device all the way to the cloud and uh, the other way around. It's also a big advantage that you have enough throughput to update the firmware over the air. So that if you want to add some more uh, a new functionality or if you have uh, a security issue or a bug, you can fix this by updating the firmware. It operates in a dedicated spectrum where the radio resources are managed. The, the operators buy a license to operate in, uh, in a specific band. So there is no interference and you have full quality of service supported. You get a reliable and predictable performance and there are very limited regulatory restrictions and the, a good example here is the, is the output power that you can have up to 23 dBm output power uh, globally with cellular IoT. And this is uh, limited if you are operating in the ISM band. And it's again extremely scalable. You can have up to 200,000 nodes per base station. So let's have a look on how you can get uh, your device connected, how you can transfer data and the different connection modes. So to, to get connected, 
the EMB broadcasts uh, master information blocks. And then the, the UE finds the best E node B to connect to through uh, analyzing the different signal strength. And the UE sends an attach request. And then the UE is authenticated using the SIM data. A connection is established and then data can be exchanged with the network. And if you don't know what this is, this is the Nordic thing in 91, our cellular IoT prototyping platform. And uh, this is a, a EMB. So let's have a look on how we can exchange data with the network. So you have two, op two options. You have control plane and user plane. The control plane is uh, intended for control traffic. So limited data traffic is possible by using time slots on air not used for control traffic. This is typically used by MBIoT. LTM can also use it, but typically it doesn't. And it's uh, the data traffic here is limited. So it uh, can be efficient for small pieces of data, maybe 10 to 20 kilobit per second. And it's suitable for using uh, to get with UDP uh, DTLS. But it's important to note that control traffic has priority over data traffic in the control plane. Then you have the user plane, which is intended for data traffic. And this is typically used by LTM. It can also be used by MBIoT, but there's a limited number of operators that support it. Here, high data traffic is possible and it's very efficient for larger pieces of data. And you can have uh, hundreds of kilobit per second for LTM. And here you can use both uh, TCP TLS and UDP DTLS. Then for how to exchange data with the cloud. Here you have two options. You can send your data through the core through the core network. So you send it with IP, non-IP to the core network, and then this is relayed up to the cloud and also the other way around when the cloud is sending data down to the device. But here the implementation is operator specific. So roaming is uh, difficult and the migrating to a new network is uh, challenging. It's also important to note that the authentication and security requirements are defined by the cellular core network here. And the cellular the core network is a trusted party in the transport layer security scheme. The other option is to have IP from your device to the cloud. And this is not going straight to the cloud, it's going through the EMB and then to the, to the cloud, but you have IP all the way. So the operator here cannot access the data. And everything is independent, it works with any network, so that is much better suited for applications where you are going to roam. So in both LTM and MBIT, you have three connection modes. You have RRC connected, where you typically transfer user data, but you have a high power consumption. And this is where you go when you, when you attach. And RRC stands for radio resource control. Then you can go to either RRC idle or to PSM. So in RRC idle, you sleep for shorter intervals to save power, and you have typically shorter downlink latency, meaning how much time it takes for the cloud to reach the device. In PSM, you can sleep for longer intervals, 
and you typically have longer downlink latency. Going from RRC idle or PSM to RRC connected is called reconnecting. This is not the same as reattaching. Re reconnecting is a much lighter procedure, so you have less overhead, it's much faster and lower power compared to reattaching. So you can go from RRC connected to RRC idle, and here you should use EDRX or DRX to sleep. And you can sleep in some different, uh, you have some different intervals and they're different, different uh, for LTM and MBIT. So with LTM you can sleep up to 44 minutes and with MDIT you can sleep up to 175 minutes. And when uh, the interval expires, you will turn on, the, the device will turn on its receiver to see if there is any, any message from the from the network. Then it will go back to sleep. But the, but the UE can wake up at any time to, to send data. And the EMB stores data for the UE if uh, there comes something from the, comes some, some data from the cloud. And then it give, then, it, then the UE will receive this data uh, at the next, at the end of next interval. Longer intervals results in longer downlink latency, but lower power. The device or UE can also go to PSM from both connected and idle. And here you can sleep in longer intervals from 10 minutes up to 1413 days. So you can sleep longer, but after the interval expires, it has to go to RRC connected at the end of, uh, at the end of the each, each interval. Also here, the UE can wake up at any time to send data, but it's much more efficient to upload data when the inter in interval expires, because then it has to go to RRC connected mode anyways. Here also the EMB stores data for the UE, so that it can receive it the next time the interval expires. Longer PSM intervals results in longer downlink latency, but lower power. Okay, SIM cards. So what is a SIM card? It's a secure microcontroller and it stores the subscriber identity and also the keys used to encrypt a connection. And the subscriber identity is used to identify and authenticate the subscriber on a cellular, in a cellular network. They come in different form factors from a solderable IC from the typical uh, form factors that you plug into your smartphones. You have three main types. You have SIM, eSIM, and iSIM. And the SIM is uh, the typical SIM. It uh, can be plug-in or solderable, and it's locked to one MNO typically. You have eSIM, which can also be plug-in or solderable IC. And here the user can change MNO and this gives uh, a lot of power to the to the user or the supplier of a product uh, because it's not tied to a specific operator, which can bring into a bit more comp competition between the MNOs. And you can always select uh, the best uh, data plan for your devices. Then you have iSIM, where the, the SIM is integrated into, into the modem or microcontroller. So you don't need a, a separate SIM card or a solderable IC that you put on your PCB. And when it comes to uh, freedom to change MNO, the user can also do, it with the, do this with the iSIM. So a few things that is good to know when selecting a cellular IoT SIM card. 
is that the SIM card can the SIM can drain much more current than the LTE modem itself. And it has two important uh, power saving modes. It has clock stop, and uh, this is uh, typically used when the SIM is not active. And here it can drain up to 100 microamps some of the SIM cards, while the best ones uh, is down to 20 microamps. So this is uh, important to know. And the mode you want to be in is power down, where the essentially the, the SIM card is uh, draining almost zero current. And this is what you want to the, the state you want to be in in the in the in the sleep intervals when you use EDRX and PSM. But some SIM cards have restrictions on the minimum sleep interval. So the minimum interval of EDRX or PSM where it can go to power down. So this should be um, as short as possible. Uh, the new SIM cards has down to, to one minute. And it's also important to check that the SIM can power down often or many times. So there are no restrictions there. Or that uh, they are uh, good enough to, uh, to your application. Okay, power consumption. So then we're back to EDRX and PSM. These are essential for cellular IoT. And if the UE doesn't uh, don't support PSM EDRX, it will have to do a network reattach every time it wants to uh, send data or receive. And this is a very power hungry operation, which you don't want to do every time you send data. But in EDRX and PSM, the networks network parameters should be retained and it can instead instead reconnect. Reconnect here is going back to RC connected. And this is a much lighter procedure compared to reattaching. It's much faster, less over than low power. Then I wanted to give some guidelines on the differences between EDRX and PSM and what you should use. But it's very difficult to give a specific answer here. But I can explain a bit. So in, in EDRX compared to PSM, it costs less current to reconnect. And, but, but you have a higher floor current. So for the NRF9160, the EDRX floor current is 7 microamps. So that's between the, the RX windows. But you don't use a lot of current to turn the, the RX window on, the, the RX on. Then you have PSM, where it costs more current to reconnect outside or inside the intervals. But if you are already in RRC connected, it's very efficient to transfer data. Because you have to go here every, every time uh, the interval expires. And the, the floor current in PSM is, is lower. So for NRF9160, the PSM floor current is 4 microamps. So which mode an application should use depends on many factors. How often does it need to send data? What are the uplink latency requirements? Can it wait for a next uh, connection in PSM to send, uh, send its data or to receive its data? And uh, what are the, the downlink latency requirements? I also wanted to add some uh, power numbers just to give you an idea of what how low the the current consumption can get uh, this is of course measured from our device the nrf 9160 system in package so the first one is uh, running in psm mode and here we send one kilobyte of data up to the cloud every 12 hours and uh, you have 12 hours downlink latency meaning that the cloud can reach you every 12 hours 
then you can achieve 5 microamps with LTM and 7 microamps with MBIoT. Then we have another example with PSM mode, sending 100 bytes of data every 2 hours and a 2 hour downlink latency. Here you get, here you can get 9 microamps with LTM and 20 with MBIoT. Then we are over to EDRX. Here we're not sending any data. We're just uh, in EDRX, turning on the receiver every 10 minutes so that uh, the cloud can, uh, can reach the device in a maximum of 10 minutes. There you have nine microamps in LTM and 11 in MBIoT. Then I also added a use uh, an example where we are uh, using the GPS as well for asset tracking applications. And here it wakes up every 2.7 minutes in the EDRX. It does a GPS fix and uploads the location data up to the cloud. And then you have a power consumption or current drain of around 0 0.75 milliamps. Then I have just one slide on how distance affects the protocol behavior. So as I mentioned, when the device is close to the base station or the EMB, it uses 16 QM. This is LTM example. It uses 16 QM and it uses a low TX power. When it's moving away, it will increase the TX power to maintain the connection while still using the highest level of modulation, 16 QAM. Moving further away, it will switch down to QPSK. And then moving further away, you also have some uh, coverage enhancement modes where you start to use uh, repetitions to still get your signal through. But then this affects efficiency, of course. And it's the EMB that dictates this, depending on the signal quality. So this means that the user equipment never uses more energy than necessary. And if you're interested to learn more about this, I suggest that you watch a video that we make made. It's available on our YouTube channel. It's called Field Testing, How Distance Affects the Behavior of LTM and MBIoT. So then it's time for questions. Let's see what we have here. The first one is, what is the difference between IoT, M2M, eSIM versus consumer SIM? There could be some differences uh, between these, uh, but all not all, all SIMs uh, support uh, the, these new technologies, LTM and MVRT. It's also some different uh, data plans uh, differences between the consumer SIMs and, and the M2M SIMs that uh, the operators uh, offer. To transmit maximum power, the LTM device will have to be able to source more current required by the LTM module. In such time, how would you manage with a small battery operated device? The power supply used in the application uh, will be required to deliver the, the amount of current needed to operate even at the maximum current consumption. This may include some, some local buffering in the power supply to lower the peak current drains from the battery, but uh, there are limitations on how much uh, you can uh, limit this. Next question is, how much are the ranges affected by mountains, weather conditions, or tall buildings? This depends on the, on the frequency band. So the, the higher the frequency, the higher the impact. For the lower frequency bands, the weather is not a big impact, but mountains will, uh, of course, limit the range. But the carriers, uh, when they place out these base stations, they put them in places uh, so that they get good coverage in the area. What is the significant difference between BLE, wire pass, and cellular IoT? Uh, yeah, there are some fundamental differences there. Uh, 
So BLE is a PAN, personal area network, typically connected to your smartphone around a, and focused around a, a person. Wirepass is a low power mesh technology, but they are still short range between the nodes. While in cellular IoT, you use uh, cellular technologies and connect to the base stations and use the infrastructure already provided by the, the operators. Next question is, do these technologies work roam globally? Are the SIM eSIMs required for these easily available? So for LTM, we have uh, roaming uh, SIMs with global coverage. But it's important to note that some carriers do not give all the all features when you use roaming cards. For example, there could be limitations uh, on the low power nodes, EDRX and PSM. And for MBIT, you usually need to get a specific card for a carrier to use. But uh, some uh, some carriers have uh, allowed also using MBIT in uh, in larger regions. Uh, iBasis is a good example here. This is the the SIM card that we provide with our development kits, and this is a, a roaming uh, eSIM card. Mm, that's answered. What is the max application throughput possible with TCP TLS using MBOT? This is not something we have measured, uh, but it's uh, very dependent on the carrier you're uh, using. And for some carriers, this is a combination that is uh, known not to work that well. So we recommend to use UDP and DTLS uh, for uh, MBOT. Then there's a comment. Uh, you have swapped DLUL bandwidth in one slide. You will have higher speed than DL. Yes, I saw that I have switched uh, those in the, in the last slide. So the the uplink throughput or bandwidth for LTM is 375 kilobits. Downlink is 300 kilobits per second. Mm. How is the band selection done for LTM? Consider a logistic case where device uh, where the device is sent uh, across the world. How is a new band selected when the device arrives at a other location? Well, it has to scan through the bands, but the, the order of uh, the, which bands it scans through is determined by advanced algorithms. And uh, the same algorithms are used in, used in smartphones as well, as well when you travel around the world. It will probably start to scan in the band. Yeah, the device used last time it was uh, operational. And then the algorithm will uh, determine which uh, band it will scan in next. I have a thing in 91. Is it possible to switch between LTM and MBOT during device operation? For example, when Thingy91 is moving and I want to use LTM as it has good mobility support and handover, but when the device is stationary for a few days after traveling, then it automatically switches to MBOT to save power without firmware change. And the answer here is uh, yes. So at least with uh, our device, we have the MBOT and LTM uh, firmware in uh, in the modem. So you can uh, switch between these, uh, but then you need to reattach to the network. But uh, for some use cases, when you are uh, know that you're going to be stationary for a long while, uh, you can switch to MBOT and use this. LTM and MBIOT has cell location, both, uh, which could be their precession. Uh, yes, they both uh, have this, uh, but the range is uh, vary a lot from 100 meters in ur ur urban areas to uh, kilometers in remote areas. So if you want to have uh, 
an accurate position, uh, we recommend to use uh, GPS. Mm. As no SMS in MBRT standard, how sleepy device can wake up for on-demand reading? Uh, here you can use PSM and EDRX to sleep for uh, longer intervals and then uh, when the intervals expire it will check with the network if there are any messages uh, uh, from the device from the network sorry uh, then there's a question about handover on MBOT, uh, just to confirm. Yes, this is something that uh, we support in our modem on MBOT and LTM. So that's, uh, that's possible. Does MBOT provide better network coverage than traditional cellular technologies like GPRS or non-cellular options like LoRa and Sigfox? So compared to the traditional cellular technologies, the answer is yes. Uh, this is both because uh, it has a smaller bandwidth giving longer range and uh, it also has uh, these uh, using these uh, lower modulation schemes and also coverage enhancement modes. Uh, the range uh, in LoRa I think is similar to MBIT while Sigfox has a uh, longer range. But here you also need to take into account uh, interference because these operate in the ISM bands. So even if you have similar or longer range in theory, in practice, the connection is not as robust, leading to uh, retransmissions and packet loss, uh, etc. cetera. Is 9160 supporting eSIM or does it require external SIM card? It supports both uh, traditional SIM cards and eSIM, both solderable and, and uh, the typical Form factors. The EDRX and PSM floor currents of 7 and 4 microamps, are these the same for LTM and MBIT? Yes, these are the, the same. And there's also a question why they are different. So in EDRX, you have um, more things on in the device, uh, resulting in a higher floor current. But uh, this also means that it's uh, cheaper to do the reconnection outside the, the or inside the intervals. And then there's a question: What is the operational voltage for those uh, current values? Uh, that was on the slide. It was three point seven volt. First one is, can you talk about the cellular data plans? In the past, the monthly cost was prohibited for our application. Do cellular companies offer less expensive uh, options? Um, the data cost varies greatly between the different MNOs, um, so it's difficult to, to know what you had to pay here, but uh, some of the MNOs are starting to go away from the monthly costs and more towards having a one-time fee that they include a certain amount of data. We also think that when more and more uh, operators uh, support these technologies, there will be some competition between them so that uh, the less expensive, uh, that, so that the data plans will be less expensive. What kind of battery and use case uh, data length and period is expected for uh, the referred 15 years battery lifetime? Uh, this is uh, very dependable on uh, on the use case, uh, how often you have to send data and uh, what kind of uh, downlink latency you need. Um, so, I mean, this 15 years of battery lifetime is for um, for a device that is sleeping uh, quite a lot, but uh, you can also have a bigger battery if, uh, and, uh, and uh, send more data. So if we're making a cellular IoT based device and would like to install it in an area with low or no LTE coverage, but have access to fiber optic or a cable internet, what will be the options for connecting cellular IoT devices to the backbone network? 
So uh, our device, at least, NRF9160, uh, only supports the, the licensed uh, bands, uh, and the operators uh, own these, uh, these bands to operate in them. So we don't really support uh, private uh, networks. Will MBOT get uh, mobility functions in time? When is this expected? Um, this is uh, something that we already support, uh, but it's a feature in release 14. Uh, so this is uh, something that is uh, rolling out with uh, different operators. What are the latency numbers for M1 and MB1? In general, the, the M1 latency is, uh, is lower, but it also depends on um, the, the EDRX and PSM interval that you have uh, selected. And uh, the uplink latency is uh, uh, not really a problem because the, you know, the, the device can wake up at any time to send data. But uh, they should, uh, if you're using PSM, you should wait for the next interval uh, to send data if you can. How non-IP is supported by Nordic Semi modems? Uh, yes, this is something that we support in our device. Uh, you have to use something called raw sockets. Can I reduce cellular costs by sending info data in the cellular info header? If so, how much data can I send in the header? Is there limits? I don't think this is something that you can do. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand the question either. And then let's see here. Um, I see there are some questions about operator support for LTM and MBIT in different countries and regions. Here I recommend to, to check out the deployment map uh, that I showed on gsma.com. Also try to reach out to the operators in your country, even though uh, an operator doesn't have na national coverage, they might have test sims. Uh, and uh, coverage in certain areas where you can uh, try this out. You can also reach out to uh, your Nordic local sales representative. Uh, they would typically know about the, the coverage in, in the region they uh, operate in. Does MBOT provide better network coverage than traditional cellular technologies like GPRS or non-cellular options like LoRa and Sigfox? And here the answer is uh, yes, when, it, when we compare it to the traditional cellular technologies. For LoRa, the range uh, is similar, I believe, while Sigfox has longer range. But here it's important to remember that these operate in the ISM bands and they are very vulnerable to interference from other wireless devices operating in the same bands. So even though the theoretical range is similar or longer, you have interference causing packet loss and retransmissions, burning power. What uh, is protocol to connect to cloud? Uh, here you typically use IP protocols. MQTT and, and co-op. You can also use uh, lightweight M2M for device management. That's what we use. Is it a bad idea to consider TCP over an MBOT network? In general, we do not recommend using TCP over MBOT because of the hand handshaking and overhead you get with TCP. So we recommend to use UDP with uh, MBOT. How long will it take for all countries to be LTM and MBIT compatible? Will it happen? We, of course, believe it will happen, um, but we cannot comment on the time frame for the different uh, operators. But uh, we have seen this uh, evolving, and uh, by looking at uh, by looking at uh, the GSMA deployment map over the last year. Uh, we can see that uh, more and more uh, countries have operators uh, where they support these technologies. MBOT roaming questions, uh, not yet, it said in the slide. Is the NRF9160 or 
is this the because of the NRF 9160 or it's a software limitation? This is mainly up to the operators. They have to make the agreements uh, between each other so that the devices can operate in, in uh, other networks. We see this is happening uh, more and more, uh, but in general, uh, roaming is uh, not supported by M uh, on uh, with MB MBIoT, and we can't really give a time frame on this uh, will be in place, but it's it's getting there. Can a regular SIM card work with MBIoT, like the SIM card in my phone, or that depends on a carrier? Uh, the operators typically offer specific SIMs to be used with these uh, technologies, M2M SIMs, they call it often, with more suitable data plans for these technologies. Do they offer any form of handover uh, for applications in vehicles? Yes, that is uh, supported with the handover, just like uh, LT in your uh, your smartphone. For MBIoT, this is a release 14 feature, so it's being uh, rolled out. If there is no support for LTM, will the modem use regular LT? We our modem only supports LTM, so that is not an option. Mm. But you can. Uh, and a device that is also supporting the higher category uh, LTE, uh, LTE categories. They are typically much more complex and drain much more current compared to our device. So it can't really be... Um, can't really be uh, compared, uh, at, least when, uh, at least not when it comes to power consumption which we believe is uh, essential for cellular IoT. Does the NRF9160 allow to run MBIoT and LTM simultaneously in order to combine both ecosystems? You cannot run them, run them at the same time. You have to select one, but the modem firmware supports both, so you can switch between them so that uh, if you know that uh, you're going into a remote area or you're going to sleep for a, a long time or send very little data, you can use MBIoT and you can use uh, LTM when you, when you are uh, gonna send a lot of data or uh, are going to update the firmware on the device. Certification has to be done by the semiconductor vendor or product developer. So we do a lot of certifications for our device, but typically for um, you have to also certify the, the end product. And uh, but we of course would like to make it as uh, simple as possible for the for the product developer, and we will guide you through the through this process. There are also test houses that can help out in this uh, process as well. Does 200K nodes refer to 200K devices? Yes, um, that doesn't sound like much in dense areas like London. So in London, you have many, many, many base stations around. So this is uh, only per, per EMB or per base station. So it's actually a quite uh, high number. While a UE is uh, sleeping, what happens if a message in the control plane comes to the EMB? Can it wake up the UE? It cannot if it's uh, if it's sleeping. It's uh, not. It doesn't have its receiver on. And uh, then, uh, if you are in EDRX or PSM, you have to wait for the next uh, for the interval to expire to get the message from the from the network. Why is reconnect less power hungry than a touch operation? When you do the attach, you have to do the frequency band search. You have to do all the authentication and everything. And uh, here you waste a lot of power, at least 10 times uh, what you do when you reconnect. Who is presently selling modules, the boards you based on the NRF9160? Um, yeah, it's the Icarus IoT board is mentioned there from Actinius. Um, 
and uh, cannot do this with Tingy 91. Um, no, the Tingy 91 is not really made for connecting a lot of hardware. But we also have the NRF9160 development kit, which have uh, a lot of pins and headers so that you can connect uh, sensors and so on to that one. What are the peak currents during uplink? So those we have in our data sheet for some different bands. But it can be around 250 milliamps if you have full uh, full TX power, 23 dBm. How often can the NRF91 refresh GPS location data? Um, it can do this very often, but if you have the GPS on all the time, this will uh, drain a lot of uh, current. If we sent a few times a day, should we go into PSM, EDRX, or complete shutdown the NRF 9160? Um, this, um, as long as you're sending uh, every day, uh, it's recommended to, to use uh, PSM. You need to have a, a longer sleep than that to before it uh, becomes uh, an option or a better option to, to shut down. And also the, the operators doesn't really like um, having devices attaching uh, too often. So in PCM EDRX mode, CATM is more power efficient than MBIT. But how is it when we transmit and connect to the base station? In general, CATM is, is more, uh, or it depends on how much data you're sending, but you're not, uh, it quickly, CATM one uh, quickly gets more power efficient. Even uh, when you're transmitting or receiving, it doesn't really matter. And, uh, this is because of the, the larger bandwidth and also because uh, you can use the higher modulation uh, getting the data through uh, quicker. Is TCP TLS supporting the MAOT as an LTM? Um, yes, uh, you can use it, but it's uh, not recommended as I uh, mentioned. Then we are five minutes over time, so I think we will wrap it up. In the end here, I will just, uh, yeah, first, uh, if you didn't get an answer to your question or you're not happy with, uh, with the answer, I, uh, I encourage you to, to go to uh, DevZone, our developer forum, and ask a question there. Then um, our application engineers are ready there to, to, uh, to help you out. You can also reach out to our sales. And if you don't know who that is in, in, the, in your region, uh, you can also uh, go to our website where there is a form to contact uh, the sales person in your, your area. I also want to mention that uh, we now have a library of different webinars. So if you're interested in in these, uh, you should go to webinars.nordicsemi.com. I'll also post a recording of this webinar here uh, together with the, the presentation so that you can watch it again if you want to. And you can also watch, uh, have a look at the presentation in detail. So thank you everyone for, uh, for listening and uh, have, a, have a nice evening. <laughs>